and our habit in the Fingal area. I said it was formed in 1985 um, when the Rogers Estuary came under threat uh, from the development of uh, the large landfill uh, site. So that's the, a lot of you may know it as the, the Balili landfill site. So when the branch formed, they started doing surveys and counts of all the birds in the estuary. Um, it soon became apparent that those um, both national and international uh, numbers of various species of birds using the estuary. And uh, they were able to use that data to prevent the, the landfill site getting expanded over the years. Um, so yeah, after the initial development at the site, um, it didn't really grow much bigger after that, uh, thanks to the, to the work off the branch at the time. Um, then just a little bit of what we do in the branch. So um, COVID aside, we generally host indoors and outdoor events throughout the year. So we normally have a number of guest speakers, um, normally somewhere between September and March, uh, maybe two or three speakers, um, open to the public and free of charge uh, on various topics. They tend to be sort of around boards, but not always. Um, Outdoor events, then we, we might have a, a tour around uh, Rogerstown or sometimes we go up to Dundalk Bay or down to Wicklow or Wexford. Um, we would typically have at least one dawn chorus and a dusk chorus event every year, um, which are very popular. Other work we do then, uh, board hides, so that we maintain two visitor hides down at Rogerstown Estuary. One on the, the south side, which is in Turvey Park, which is open to the public every Saturday and Sunday from September through to March. And then we've one on the, the north side as well. Then from, we do a lot of survey work. So the initial work that are the surveys that the guys carried out back in 1985, that has continued on in the form of a high web survey. So that's international or sorry, Irish um, wetland board survey. So that's carried out once a month from September through to March. We're also involved in country board survey, breeding board surveys. Uh, we've done those in Newbridge and Turvey. Um, there's a small population of lapwing breeding in the estuary, so we were regularly surveying those. And we've recently carried out a, a baseline survey for the, the new coastal greenway um, up towards Balbriggan. Another big project that we've been pretty heavily involved in the last number of years is the Little Turn project in Portran. Um, these birds are really struggling to to uh, hang on in not just in Ireland or not just in Dublin, but in Ireland this is the last site in Dublin that has these birds, and they're very prone to disturbance because they actually nest on the beach itself. So for the last number of years, we've been fencing that off, trying to uh, keep the public at a safe distance and and their pets as well. And um, we try to have a volunteer or at least two volunteers. For the majority of the day, um, from towards the end of this month right through until the birds fledge. And with the thanks to, I know, County Council and the NPWS have helped a lot with this, but there's a huge amount of volunteer work going into it. And with their help, we've managed to get uh, 26 chicks fledged over the last number of years. And uh, we're in the process of kicking it off again for this year. So fingers crossed we'll get some more off this year as well. And then just finally, um, if you want to contact us, we have a, a website. If you want to pop on to the next slide, Ricky. It's just um, bwifingal.ie is our website. Um, we're also, you can also find us on Facebook and on Twitter. Um, just, yeah, just search for us and you, we'll, we'll pop up. So we regularly, um, if we have events or and like that, we want to promote, um, you'll find information about it on there. Sorry about that, Paul. I, um, I, I put that slide to the end, I think, the contact slide. Yeah, that's no problem. Yeah, yeah. we we'll just go with us, you'll have no problem finding us anyway. Thanks a million, Okay, Paul. thank you. Cheers. So I just want to um, remind people before I get into it, um, that if you want to ask questions, you might add them to the chat. Um, to the chat uh, column and then we Sinead will go through them at the end and, and we can go through them and then uh, uh, we can open up the mics at the end and, and, and answer your questions as well so uh, if you want to put them in the chat that's that's grand and um, I'll crack on any and if you have any questions about any of what I mentioned or Paul uh, mentioned or the, the branch or for Sinead um, 
you can you can ask then at the end there'll be plenty of time so um i want to talk about um communities uh, conserving birds and how you can get involved and uh, what's covered in this talk talking specifically about species that are under threat so not things that are not nice kind of i suppose um projects that look nice and uh, everyone feels good about it but specifically for birds that are of conservation concern um, and we want to talk about grey wagtails and dippers swifts water birds generally um uh, ground nesting birds, barn owls and kestrels, and then we have some useful resources uh, at the end. And um, so <clears throat> we've got a lot of common birds and there's a lot of things you can do for common birds in your garden and, and elsewhere, but they don't really need our help, although we love them so much. So I have these little symbols here, uh, which is which refers to the last slide. Um, which is this thing here is just, it's called the Bucky List. It's the Birds of Conservation Concern in Ireland. It's basically a, a, a traffic light system that we can demonstrate what birds are, are in serious decline or in trouble. So there's a red, there's a red list, there's an amber list, and there's a green list. Birds on the green list, we're not too worried about. They're doing okay on their own. The likes of robins, wrens, and blackbirds. The ones on the amber list, you can see there, you can read a few. Uh, you've got fulmer, shag, short-eared owls, kingfishers, merlin, chuff, Skylark, linnets, pipe flycatchers, goldcrest. Some birds you'll recognize there, their names, and they're what you would think is quite common birds, but they're undergoing various declines across their, their distribution and a range and in Ireland and elsewhere. So we're really worried about them. And it's the birds really in the amber list that you can help out because they're sort of teetering, but they're not quite on the edge like the birds on the red list. So really we do focus a lot on, on, on birds in the amber list, but equally the ones on the red list, um, it's pretty significant there. They're the likes of the curlew, corn crake, swifts that are really, really, really in bother um, and that need help. So um, they're the ones we want people to focus on um, and not quite the, the, the birds that are green listed. We're not too worried about them in terms of a conservation value, if, if you like, but we still obviously really appreciate them and like seeing them and all that business. So talking like, uh, like about birds like barn owls, um, gray wagtails, uh, curlew, swift. So each of those uh, birds sort of represent different groups. Uh, the barn owl represents sort of raptors or birds of prey, which all sort of are under significant pressure for various reasons. Habitat loss, secondary poisoning, and um, various things, even persecution. So uh, all we can do to help raptors and birds of prey is, is, is good. So we'll talk a lot about uh, barn owls later on and kestrels. Grey wagtails are riparian birds, which are, they, they, they like fresh water, they like to be around water. So um, you'll see them along rivers and, and, and close to water bodies as well. And they're suffering from um, sort of the, the, the decline in water quality, uh, habitat loss, disturbance, all sorts of reasons, but primarily uh, water quality problems. So uh, anything you can do uh, to, to help that, um, and even loss of nest sites. So we're going to talk specifically about the box as well, because we've... Um, We've sort of canalized our, our rivers uh, and stuff, and we've we've altered them and engineered them that they're not they're not naturally uh, or they're not what the birds would find natural. And um, so anything we can do to help those those river birds is, is a good move. Your water birds here, represented by this curlew uh, down the bottom, are, are under a lot of pressure. So um, there's various reasons: uh, loss of habitat, pollution on our coasts and on, on our on our wetland sites, drainage on our wetland sites, which is all it ties into loss loss of habitat and stuff. Um, climate change is massive when they, they, they when they're going to their breeding grounds up north they're finding um <clears throat> that sometimes there's still snow and ice when they get up there uh, because the whole world is out of sort of kilter uh, and then um it's just it's just totally throwing their season and they're short stopping and there's invasive species that couldn't usually breed where they naturally breed and they've moved up into those territories and all sorts of stuff so our 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 our, 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 our water birds are under really a lot of pressure and then swifts basically have a housing crisis um, and they're under pressure from, from things related to climate change as well, um, such as uh, on, on migration, they're encountering severe weather events, which is basically um, killing them. They just can't um, get through these storms and they're falling out of the sky uh, in, their, in, their, in their tens and hundreds. And it's, um, it's not good. And then when they do get up to Europe and in Ireland, um, we've actually boxed them. We've, we, we've, we've renovated them and uh, built them out of our, out of our buildings. So, they're under a lot of pressure there. And you've seen the example Sinead gave at the school there where they've provided sort of safe and permanent nest sites for swifts, uh, which is a really good thing. And it's a, a very, very, very easy thing we can do for them. So 
we'll talk a lot about that. So dippers and grey wagtails. So uh, grey wags are on the, 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 the red list. So we're really interested in helping those. Dippers share very um, similar habitats, more fast running water. Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with, with Fingal's rivers, but I'm not sure if it's quite dipper territory, but certainly to be lots of lots of grey wagtails. Um, but sort of similar things to help both of them. So it's, it's, it's a good thing to consider. Um, <clears throat> dippers nest early in, in the season of February. So you normally find them on eggs uh, or even chicks in, on Paddy's Day. Um, <clears throat> grey wagtails nest a bit later in April and May and often use bridges and walls and overhanging vegetation for nesting. So there's a typical grey wagtail nest uh, near water uh, in a stone sort of um, bank uh, along, along a river. Um, <clears throat> they're found regularly nesting in towns and villages. Yeah, you'll often hear a grey wagtail um, sort of calling along a river bank in the middle of a town. They're, they're quite nice. Um, and then Dipper builds this huge kind of dome nest of wet moss from the river uh, under bridges and on ledges and, and all sorts of stuff, but always over water. It's like a huge wet wren's nest, basically. And they're really, really, really cool. So um, that's their natural site, but they will, they will readily use nest boxes where they can't find a natural niche or ledge to build on. So a couple of nest sites here, you might not see them. So a couple of gray wag and, 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 and dipper nests here. So um, there was a gray wagtail nest in this, this, um, this concrete hole there, um, dipper nest there under the bridge. Dipper nest there hanging over in the overhanging tree in the river. And then there's a grey wagtail nest in that ivy overhanging the river as well. So they're the sort of places you find them in natural and semi-natural situations. This is Alex Copeland, uh, ex-colleague in Birdwatch Ireland. He's since moved on, but he was the dipper guy uh, in Birdwatch Ireland. He would have done a significant amount of work, especially around Leash and Offaly um, and down in Kerry uh, for, uh, on dippers. Um, so we put up these nest boxes. These are do hollow. The, the hollow project and there's two different nest box designs here very very simple very cheaply done so this one is basically a uh, marine plywood and it's stuck to the bridge with a gal galva band it's called and it's just bolted up into the bridge and the dipper will build their nest in there and this one is um i forget the name of the piping but it's um it's it's basically drainage piping and it, it's stuck to there with with the same with this galva band and it allows if the flood water rises in the river, it allows it just to flow straight through, and it won't rip it off the won't rip it off the box. So it's a very cheap way of providing a, a, a place for dippers to nest. So it's a good idea. And just this is this is um this is what a really expensive um woodcrete uh, nest box for dippers uh, that uh, Alex put up a few of them around Leash and Offaly. And typically, um the dipper decided to build its nest on top instead of in the box where that was provided. So uh, that's 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 pretty typical of birds. And that's just a dipper nesting uh, being ringed that's part of a part of a study in, in leash. So this is what they look like. They, uh, gray wagtails like open fronted boxes uh, above water. You can use traditional wooden ones, but um they they in in those in those sort of wet um habitats, they don't last very long, they're a bit pointless. So um sometimes it's better to go for the plastic pipe version or or the wood creed version here that you can buy. Now that when I say they're they're very expensive, I mean they're they're not 20 quid or they're 40 or 50 is what I mean, uh, but they last a very, very long time. So they're worth, worth sticking up. Um, yeah, so we're talking about just some problems that they're facing. I, I already mentioned it, but um, like talking about uh, to help them other than just boxes. I mean, river cleanups are great and looking after those riparian zones and um, anything you can do to improve the water quality. And there is um, you, some of you will know about the, the local authority waters program or law, law pro. Um, that have officers around the country um, set up and um, you know a resource to help communities um, get involved with their rivers and wetlands and and try do something about it so they're really good people to reach out to too I wouldn't be an expert on on on, on improving water quality and um, so but they're definitely definitely people to link up to with as well so to consider and um, if you can clean up your rivers and, and the different pollutants getting into it you'll it'll go a long way, a long way to improve things for sure for those species. Uh, and ever like, I mean, people love uh, pulling up, you know, uh, you know, pulling up their sleeves and, and getting, and there's nothing as uh, satisfying as sort of looking at all the, the bags of, of rubbish you've, you've got out of the river or wherever um, after a day's work. So it's, um, it's a really nice community project to do when, it, when it's safe to do so and we can all get out again. So SWIFTS, um, 
I'm big into Swifts just because it's where I've been working um, for, 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 for a good few years now. And um, they're brilliant. They're kind of one of these birds that once you get involved in, it's hard to, um, it's hard to let go. And, and people get very territorial about their Swifts. It's quite funny. Um, it's, 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 they're, they're a bit addictive. So this is a Swift in the hand. Very rare to see them that way. They nest high up in buildings and cracks and walls and under roof tiles and uh, under roof plate where they can access uh, 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 the, the, the roof plate, which is basically where the roof meets the meets the, the wall of the house. This is swift in flight. You can see the, the characteristic sickle-shaped wings uh, and the, 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 the shallow forked tail um, and this kind of uh, torpedo-shaped body. And um, they're built for life in the sky and they, they feed on the wing, they uh, drink on the wing, they mate on the wing and they even sleep on the wing. They're, they're, they're quite a unique species. Um, and they can remain in constant flight for 10 months. So once the chick fledges and leaves its, its, its nest uh, in Ireland in, in, in early August, it flies back down south to the Congo and it won't even land to rest again till it returns to Ireland the following year to try find a nest of its own. Um, and some, some scientists will claim that actually they're not mature to breed until they're three. So technically they could remain in, in constant flight for two or three years, um, which is just bizarre. They've got their, their Latin name or their scientific name is Apis Apis, which means translates to without feet. And they don't, they have feet. You can see this guy's feet here, but their feet are adapted to cling onto vertical surfaces. So all their, all their, all their toes are front facing. And um, so they can't, they can't perch like other birds. So if you see what you think is a swift perched on a wire, the rule of thumb is it isn't because they can't perch like that. Also, if you see a nest, uh, it's not a swift because swifts always nest in cracks and crevices away from away from sight. So you see this guy peeping out. He's about to leave his nest here in the crack in the wall just there. So that's very typical. So it's good rule of thumb. If you see the nest, it's not a swift. It's probably a house martin or a, sw or a swallow, which people mix them up with all the time. So we created this poster, which is a good one, even for local community um, groups or Tidy Towns Facebook pages. It might be really useful to share. And that's just rip that off the, the Birdwatch Ireland um, Facebook feed or Twitter or, or website and share it because people do confuse these four species all the time. So there's your swift, like I said, with the sickle wings. Uh, your house martin got this characteristic white rump patch on top. Um, then you've got swallows, which, which everyone knows and loves with the big white belly and the long forked tail. Uh, and then your sand martin, so-called, because they nest in, in sand uh, cliffs and the banks of rivers and, and quarries and stuff. But they'll also uh, obviously confuse or confusingly again, they will also nest in cracks in masonry and, and stuff like uh, they love um, they love key walls and canal canal locks and stuff where they where the mortar, the lime mortar has fallen out between the big old cut stones. They'll quite often go in there and nest as well, which people can mix them up for, for swifts for that reason. So that's a really useful poster just for for reference and um, it might be good for, for Facebook pages and stuff for Tidy Towns or even to reproduce it um, and put it up on local display or, or anything really, um, you know, so it's a good idea or do a version of it. So the reasons for the decline. And so the last, the CBS, Paul mentioned, uh, the lads do a lot of surveys. The Countryside Bird Survey we do every year on behalf, Birdwatch Ireland do every year on, on coordinate for the National Parks and Wildlife Service. And in less than 20 years, um, they've found a 58% decline in, in, in swift populations in Ireland. So that's significant, that's plummeting. Um, <clears throat> a couple of reasons. Um, the Swifts have a housing crisis. So what's happened here, this church demonstrates one of the problems we see across the country. We go to renovate buildings, demolish buildings or whatever, and we don't think that there's Swifts there. A lot of the time, nobody knows they're there and they do it without even knowing. So here's a, here's a church being renovated somewhere in the country stick up the scaffolding, there's six or eight uh, swift nest sites in this, like Sinead said, they're colonial bird or the nesting colonies. So where you get one swift nest, you can get five, 10, 15, 20 nests. The colonies get really big, but overnight you can lose a colony by the work being done and not considering the swifts at all or blocking them at their entrance. So the adult swifts return, they're site faithful. They return to the same crack or crevice every year for anything from eight to 10 to, to up to 20 years they can live. So just say their breeding life could be 10 years. So if they can't get in, they find it really hard to find a new nest site and they could lose multiple uh, breeding breeding years, which which just totally throws them 
and over time then the, the, the population obviously decreases when birds aren't getting to reproduce. Uh, big problems with, with, with climate change um, and it's affecting the amount, uh, we, we, it's affecting their migration. Uh, there's more storms on migration. The Sahara Desert is getting bigger, so they're crossing uh, uh, bigger distances. That doesn't, uh, that really affects the likes of swallows and it is starting to affect uh, swifts as well, but not as much. Their food is a big problem. So when I was a boy, um, I'm in my mid thirties now. So when I was 20, 25 years ago, um, my dad's car would be caked in moths and insects like every couple of days, I'd be sick washing it for him. But now you just don't, it could be, you could go a couple of years without having to wash your car, uh, the insects off your car these days. So the biomass is just not there like it used to be. And it's not that swifts are falling out of the sky hungry, but it just means they're not fledging as much young because the, 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 the amount of insects and biomass just isn't there to be getting off reams and reams of, 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 of chicks all the time, you know? So it's, it's difficult for them. The Celtic tiger is represented by this guy here, the green tiger, and, and that represents the rate of development and the boom and the amount of buildings that would have came, been removed out of circulation as housing for Swifts during that period. Um, because we, we renovated and we demolished a lot of buildings, old buildings that would have suited Swifts, the ones that have nice cracks and crevices and stuff like that. So big problem. This house down here is in Banagher in Offaly, one of the Swift hotspots in the country. It's two doors up from the, the, the Midlands, Birdwatch Ireland Midlands office. And myself and my boss, Brian, who were the Swift guys in, in Birdwatch Ireland, went on holidays one week um, at the same time. And when we got back, this roof had been replaced. We never even knew it was happening. And there was eight Swift Swiftness in there, all lost. Um, and that's how quickly it can happen. That's two doors up from Birdwatch Ireland. So it, it happens so fast. So anything we can do for them is really, really important. <clears throat> There's loads, as I said, people get addicted to Swifts. A lot of people want to get behind Swifts. Uh, we've got Swift Conservation Ireland um, and Swift Conservation Mayo. They're the same people. It's Linda Huxley over in Mayo. She is kind of, she is, the, I mean, she was doing it before it was cool, I suppose. And um, she's done an awful lot of work out west and she's done an awful lot of um, advisory work elsewhere around the country. She's really, really big into Swift nest boxes and, um, can learn a lot from her and she's always very helpful if you reach out to her and she's got a really good website and lots of good resources on that so that's swiftconservation.ie you see there northern ireland swift group as well they've been at it a while i'll show you one of their projects in a minute birdwatch ireland been at it about uh six eight years now really full on we've done 11 12 uh um county swift surveys and follow-up measures as well so and we're we're, we're we're actually surveying dublin city council's boundary this year which is a massive undertaking because just the urban density is, is crazy, but we're looking forward to getting our teeth into that. Lots of tidy towns groups getting involved and of course RSPB up north as well, big into it as well. And um, so not to mention all the Birdwatch Ireland branches and SWIFT sort of ambassadors all around the country. It's a lot of people now, but it's never enough. So um, the more the merrier for sure. This is just a quick project just to show you very, very simple, <clears throat> similar to what Sinead mentioned. You've got two triple cavity boxes here. So it's basically an apartment block for Swifts. You'll hear a lot of reference to triple cavity and single cavity boxes when you're talking about Swifts. It's, they've got, they're, they're divided internally. So you've got three separate nest sites in each. So we say if you're going through the effort of getting height for hire or ladders or a, or a, or a tradesman out, you might as well put up a second box. Because they nest in colonies, it will, once they, once they, uh, once they become resident in one of your boxes, they'll begin to spread. So you don't want to have to get a ladder out the following season and, and try get another box up and all that sort of stuff. So we always say is get at least six six nests up there in, in one go. And then you have a little bit of flexibility for the colony to grow. And the other aspect of it is the caller system. So Swifts like to be where other Swifts are. So to attract them to a new novel site that they're not aware that Swifts are, because there are none, because you've just put up the boxes, we play an audio lure, which is basically the duetting call of the male and the female, and it attracts the Swifts to check out what's going on here. The must, our buddies must be down there nesting. And they'll swoop down and they'll have a look and they'll go, oh, wait, what's all this? Nice boxes there. And they'll have a look and hopefully move in. So what you get is you get, you get birds that aren't breeders yet. You get young birds. We call them bangers because what they do is they come down and they bang against the box. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to figure out if there's anyone inside because if they go into another Swift's nest it, they'll turn it'll turn into a row and those rows can be fatal so they don't like to risk that so what they do is they bang up against the wall um, or the nest box or whatever it is to see if anyone's inside 
And if there's no sort of response from inside, they'll stick their head in, they'll check it out and they'll have a look. And then the following year, hopefully it'll come back and nest. And um, so they're, they're, they're quite funny. So in the first year, you can think you've got Swiss, but actually they're just prospecting for the following year. So it's, um, it's really interesting. So this is, um, I think it's the art center in, in Trim, in, in Mead, and there's two triple cavity boxes with a caller here. And that's Brian Caffrey uh, just doing a talk with the local scouts, um, which nice project. And there's birds in there now. Actually, sorry, there's a third, there's a third bird uh, box on that on that corner. I'm just realizing this is Markovich House in Sligo, the Sligo branch, uh, and a couple of individuals in Sligo are, are, are big into Swifts. Um, and this is these are fully occupied now. Sligo is a real hot spot for Swifts. It's um go there on a summer's evening and the place you had to be screamed off. Yeah, there's a lot of Swifts in Sligo, which is great. Um, and these are single cavity boxes, and they've got um they've got slope roofs to stop the likes of jackdaws and potentially cats perching on top and sort of having a go at the Swifts coming and going. So that's if they're not under if they're not under a ledge, it's worth getting the ones with the slope roofs. But uh, it won't we won't get into too much detail here for a minute. But they're all fully occupied and they've doubled the boxes there now. This is a project I just got these photos last night on on my WhatsApp. This is a restoration oh. of Baltic Glass Convent. Um, and these are the Louvre windows in, in the old bell tower in the convent. Uh, it, it, the, 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 the convent's been closed years and years and it's just, just been redeveloped now. And we did the Wicklow Swift survey in 2019 and we noticed this building and we asked a local Swift guy, would he go, uh, Brian O'Reilly's his name, would he go and ask the builders, was there any chance we could put these boxes up in the Louvre? So they said, yeah, no hassle. And um, I think regrettably so now because it's taken two years to sort of get it done and get sorted. But here's the Louvre windows and he's put in the Swift boxes here. As you can see, so there's um there's three long boxes with four nests. I'll show you actually here. So uh, this is without the back screwed on. So you've got four different nest boxes. You got little nest cups here to help them along. Swifts have to build their nests <laughs> with stuff they find uh, on the wing. They can't land and grab bits of feathers or grass or whatever. So it can take them years to build any sort of significant nest. So they build this tiny cup just to to retain the eggs from rolling out. Uh, it's really quite interesting. So. Uh, what we do is in new boxes, we put in these little nest cups to help them along just to save them a bit of a job in the first year. So got the staggered entrances to stop them landing on top of each other if they're, if they're, when they're leaving the boxes. So he's got the 12, 13, 14 boxes. Really good. If we could get these in every church tower in the country, uh, a lot of the work would be done. It'd be great. And it'd be nice, nice sort of a project to marry up with the, with the local religious groups and all that sort of stuff where, you know, some of them are just empty they're not even used there's not even a bell on the go and um a ringing bell an active bell isn't a problem if that's if anyone's going to ask that question this is the crescent art center in belfast and i'm showing it because it demonstrates swift bricks uh, and, a, and a historic building and it, it 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 shows where the building could still go ahead and get its new roof and um, but the swifts could still remain inside so if there's any planners or county council people or uh, engineers or architects in this call uh, this is a really good one for you to look at. Do not fear Swifts. You don't have to hide the fact that there's Swifts in buildings. You can work around them all the time with very minimum cost uh, and, and, and problems once you do it right. So this is the old part of the building. You can see the old stone all cleaned up and nice. Roof was replaced. There's tons and tons of Swifts on the roof plate. They did the work outside the Swift season and they retained all those old natural nests. A few had to be lost for, for minor uh, sort of changes and bits and bobs, so there's nothing they could do about it. To mitigate for that, they added these swift bricks. So they're built into the fabric of the building in the new extension part of the building. Um, so they're really, really nice and they fit right in and they can't even be seen. So architects and engineers and building owners like those quite a lot because they're not sitting proud of the building. They've since been painted and you can't see them at all and the swifts have moved in. So they've actually increased the number of swifts in that building, which is really, really good. <clears throat> that's the old Conley, that's the new ones. Uh, they put interpretation out in the courtyard because they were so sort of, I suppose, proud of the story. But here, and then the, because it's an art centre, they commissioned this big timber swift to sort of as a as a piece, uh, as a nod to the swifts in the roof and as a conversation starter, I suppose, in the art centre. But just it's a good idea, even in a community space, maybe to have a sculpture like that to raise awareness about any species. It could be a giant curlew, it could be a bumblebee, it could be... Um, it could be a skylark, you know, whatever species or whatever conversation or whatever uh, uh, animal or group or, or you're trying to raise awareness for these conversation starters and these uh, arts pieces are, are a really good idea as well. It doesn't have to be 
sort of hands-on conservation all the time so we can think outside the box. And that project won an award, um, the Hamilton Architects that won the award of the United Nations um, for sustainable buildings. So it's really good as well. And, uh, you know, so it, it, it gave it a nod that way. Here are some different kinds of boxes. So typical timber box. We try to discourage people using timber ones, but to be honest, it's just because after a few years, they, they, they tend to decay and fall apart. Um, but if you've got them up under good cover, up under eaves, and um, they're not getting too much of the weather, it's okay because the Swifts need them for at least 10 or 12 years. So what you don't want happening is after five years, they fall off the roof or fall off the wall. And then the Swifts come back after five years and they're not there. And then they can't find their nest site. It's just bad news. This is made out of plastic, a recycled plastic. It's a good option. This is Schwegler German made boxes. There's a two year waiting list for those now. It's gone crazy. Um, can't get them really. And this is a Swift brick, um, which they get integrated into the wall. A uh, really good idea, really good idea for schools, libraries, public buildings, even residential buildings. If you can get a get a terrace of a terrace of houses or a group of a group of people, a residence group involved, it'd be deadly. Very so you put up your box, you have your nest cup, you don't always have to use nest cups, and then you have this audio system as it, but it's basically a cheap um a, a cheap amplifier you get on Amazon, a, a little external speaker in a waterproof box on the wall, ran as far as you need with speaker wire, which is cheap as chips. So even if your power socket is 100 meters down the road, uh, speaker wire is, is really, really cheap. So you don't need to worry about having power right beside the box or anything. Um, and that's sort of how it's done. So it could be two years ago now, we created this Saving Swifts Guide. And we basically try to marry all the information that's out there. So Swift Conservation Ireland have heaps of information on their website. Uh, Swift Concert or um, Save, Saving Swifts UK, Northern Ireland Swift Group. So many experts putting out so much information. So what we try to do is draw it all into one place and put it in a nice, attractive, a user friendly guide. So that's that's online now and um, it's available. It's called Saving Swifts, free download on the Birdwatch Ireland website. If you Google, uh, if you Google Birdwatch Ireland Saving Swifts, you'll find it. Uh, it's very easy and it, it's free as well. And there's various case studies and stuff. So water birds, so ye are up in Fingal are blessed with so many wetland sites. And I'm a leash man, so we don't. We're, 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 we're impoverished for wetland sites, really. And um, we've got lots of nice rivers, but no big, big estuaries or obviously or anything like that. So wetland birds, um, like your waders, your wildfowl, your 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 herons, your ducks, your swans, all that sort of stuff, um, <clears throat> really love Fingal um, because the habitats are, are correct. Um, You've got two things that are that are brilliant with these estuaries is you've got the the Irish Sea is um is sort of obviously less hostile than the Atlantic, but a lot of these birds are coming from continental Europe and and, and, and northeastern Europe. So they're coming down um the Irish east coast anyway. They're coming into um they're spending time on our coast in the winter where it's they've bred in places like Siberia, Arctic Canada, Greenland. Iceland and then they come down to Ireland for the winter because it's it's really moderate for them here compared to the, where they've where they've bred and um, these lovely estuaries are protected by these these beaches um, and these headlands so they've got all this lovely wet mud full of invertebrates worms mollusks uh, all these lovely things it's just full of food they've got protection from the storms uh, and the tide comes in and out once a day or twice a day and then um, basically refills, stocks the larder, and it's just perfect. Um, it's ideal for them, but then uh, then we, we then we put throw humans into the mix and we create pollution problems, we create disturbance problems, we create uh, habitat loss problems, drainage problems. Uh, so it's us really that's the problem there. So in terms of water birds and water bird sites and wetland sites, it's really our own behavior we're trying to manage and anything you can do locally to try, I suppose, promote good behavior, to advocate for the birds, especially in the winter when, when they really need a bit of help, when it's hostile conditions. Um, and they, they, they really, uh, they've, you know, you've got sort of situations, say you've got this oyster catcher here, it's, it's, it's bred in Scotland, it's migrated across, okay, it's not a huge migration, but it still has a, has a cost to its body. Um, and it comes to Rogerstown Estuary, it's after flying from Scotland, it's got zero fat left on its body after making a flight. And then your dog tiddles, runs down the beach, flushes it. It disturbs it, has to fly over the way to get to avoid the dog. 
that's fine, no big deal. But then Maura's dog comes along and does the same 20 minutes later and it happens. So it's death by a thousand cuts. It's fine if one person does it. But when the behavior is happening every um, every so often, it's 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 just it's it's killer. Uh, and it does affect the birds and it can literally exhaust them to the point where they just fall over and die. And I do a lot of work on, on Bull Island and Sandy Mount Strand. And during the lockdown, it was just crazy the amount of disturbance, the amount of people out there. And um it's 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 hard to hard to watch. And um so we really, we really have to do everything we can to try help and um, try to sort of change people's behavior and just create that awareness and just try to get people to be more responsible, I suppose. That's right. So there's significant declines. I mean, you've all heard about it. Uh, I give you so many examples. Um, water bird populations are just, just plummeting. Big problem is disturbance, dogs or otherwise. Then you got other problems like um, plastics and, sorry, excuse me, um, <clears throat> pollution, uh, plastic pollution, all that. So, you know, if we can keep those habitats in good health, that includes um, water quality that's going out into our estuaries and onto our in, into the sea, and um, the the habitat itself and the beaches. So, beach cleanups are important, and then awareness raising as well. So, it's like there's sort of little things you can do. You might think it's not not making a huge impact, but you see here more Bay partnership over in the UK, and um, they're talking about responsible. Um, you know, uh, dog ownership and uh, um, you be careful of ground nesting birds. So they're using this, they've, they've created this sort of penny, which is their, 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 their fake ring plover, if you like, but it demonstrates what, that there's ground nesting ring plover on this, on this gravel beach or pebble beach. And same as the little terns that Paul mentioned earlier. And they have to, they have to fence those, that, that little turn colony from dogs and walkers because people just are not behaving and they're very difficult to see in fairness and your dog could run through a little turn colony or ring probably the, the 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 birds have evolved to be so discreet whilst nesting to avoid predators that you just don't see them and before you know it you've trampled the nest or whatever so we have to be make people aware that they're there it could be through seasonal signage it could be through zoning our our parks and our, our beaches say okay this is a no-go zone between uh, the first of march and the middle of august or whatever so uh, you might need to think about those things with your local authority and, and, and things like that if it's if it's a repeat problem. We had a lovely project in um, in Dublin a few years ago. Uh, a lady in the in DCC, Dublin City Council, Neveny Coleman, uh, came up with this uh, project called the Brent Goose Ambassadors. And what we were doing is we were going to local schools in North Dublin. We were giving them a lecture about Brent geese and how they migrated to Arctic Canada to breed. And then the whole the family group returned back to Bull Island for the winter. <clears throat> and you could see the adults and the, and the youngsters together. And then they all made a return journey again after the winter. And they, they came to Dublin to feast on the eel grass, the Zostra on Bull Island and places. And it was really nice. So the kids first had a lecture in the school. Then they came out to Bull Island to see the, 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 the geese for themselves, the Brent geese, uh, and learn about the different conservation um, <clears throat> problems they have. And one of them, big one, is disturbance. And before we knew it, they were sort of door stopping people walking dogs and stuff. And they're going, hey, mister, stop walking your dog without a lead. And it's frightening the geese and stuff. It was really funny. But all those kids were going home to their mams and dads and grannies and granddads and telling them all about the Brenkies. So little education projects like that, it might seem like it's all very, um, but they're nice things to do. And, um, you know, it gets the community involved and the kids in the schools. And grandparents. Um, Bird. Sorry, I don't know if someone's trying to ask someone. Ricky, would you be able to mute everybody? I think yeah. a few people are not muted. That'd be great. Thanks. One second. Mm -hmm. No. So ground nesting birds, kind of similar situation. You've got lots of nice beaches and sand dune systems. Uh, Port Marnock is a perfect example. Uh, there you're going to have skylarks. Uh, these guys here, amber listed, ground nesting species, typically nest in places, nice places like sand dunes where you get lots of people in the summer, uh, trampling them and with their dogs and disturbing them and all sorts. So it's about being making people aware that they're there, maybe putting up temporary signage, temporary fencing even. Uh, zoning, uh, volunteer wardens, uh, Facebook, uh, uh, 
uh, campaigns, whatever it is to make people more aware uh, just of what they're doing and keep an eye out and avoid these sensitive birds. Meadow pipits the same, more of a grassland species. Um, <clears throat> get them probably in turvy quite a bit in places like that. Uh, and again, uh, can, can, can be a, a, a species that suffers from, from too many people uh, and dogs and disturbance and all that sort of stuff because unfortunately the nest on the ground and not not safe up in trees or whatever so they're the kind of they're kind of species to sort of consider as well very difficult to physically protect they sort of don't do themselves any favors but i suppose awareness raising and thinking outside the box maybe um about those and changing people you get you can get communities become very proud about things they'll all get behind maybe little turns and every year the whole the whole community rallies behind you know the little turn colony to try and make sure they fledge young and all that sort of stuff so if you can get people excited about the likes of skylarks and bring them out maybe dawn chorus to hear them singing i mean the, the 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 song of the skylark is famous um and it's it's really beautiful thing so you could maybe do events around that each year welcome the skylarks back something like that so those sort of ideas are, are nice as well and like i say it doesn't have to be all fences and um you know you, you know you know i suppose um physical conservation in that sense so again, even getting a, an article in the local papers every year about, uh, you know, say, you know, ground nesting bird season starts now. Here's the sort of sites that you have to be more cautious around. Please keep your dogs on leads when you're X, Y, and Z, uh, and that sort of thing. You can even arrange a responsible dog uh, ownership, uh, responsible dog walks, uh, bits and bobs with maybe a, a local bird expert at a branch. And, and do it that way and get people in twos and basically um, policing drone behavior, I suppose, and um, changing their behavior. <clears throat> Barn owls and kestrels. Um, moving along now quite fast. I'm just checking my time. Oh, we're grand. Um, raptors, birds of prey, people tend to love them. Um, so they're not a hard sell at all. So we're kind of back to uh, boxes here in, 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 in many respects. Boat red listed species. Various reasons for their declines. Barn owl is just stunning; like they're 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 amazing. And this uh, tree hole uh, is very very sort of um, very very natural uh, nest site for 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 a barn owl. But you don't see too many of them these days. Um, <clears throat> they'll nest. Uh, barn owls will nest in chimneys in old cottages. Love them uh, in ruins. Uh, and kestrels will love love ruins as well of old castles. That's a really well kept ruin. And uh, you probably get raven there even peregrine. So those big old ruins of those tower houses are, are quite significant for birds of prey. Um, and and big old big old dead trees like that as well. Really, really, really good uh, sites. So in that one, <clears throat> you have, sorry, excuse me. So you got those chicks there, the, the Kestra chicks in that, in that hole in the tree there. Uh, so that's just to show you what they're up to. So this is a, these are barn owls, this is a barn owl nest, you get this whitewash, a very typical, so um, these, these are, these are barn owl pellets, so they're what they cough up, it's not poo, so it's basically like a cat's fur ball, it's all the stuff, it's the hair and the fur of the rodents and the bones, you can see the bones here, of the shrews and the mice that they can't digest, and they cough those up, so you often find these, a load of these, these uh, barn owl pellets uh, near the nest site or where they're roosting, and then this whitewash is a giveaway as well, very characteristic. Of, and that's basically made from all the calcium and the bones of all the animals they're eating. That's what makes it so white. And the birds are up here somewhere and they're, they're pooing down and it's, it's whitewashed. So if you go into a room, you see this whitewash down the wall somewhere around the ground, you can be fairly fairly certain there's, there's a raptor uh, nesting nearby. And of course, when you find feathers, you're normally onto a winner as well. So rodenticides are a problem. There's a thing called secondary poisoning. Um, where the sort of barn owls are out looking for, for rodents, be it mice or rats or whatever. And uh, th they find an easy, easy pickings in a poisoned rat uh, or two or three or four. And over time, that poison builds up in the, in basically in the, in, 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 in the bird's liver. And some night it just succumbs to it, it just falls out of the sky dead. So there's been a lot of campaigns to get farmers and, uh, in the, you know, companies and stuff that use a lot of rodent side to sort of start using live trapping or even encourage barn owls because they eat so many, so many ra uh, rodents. It's good to have them around uh, and stuff like that and uh, various things like that. So trying to cut back on 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 these rodenticides, it's it's pretty bad for raptors. Um, <clears throat> providing nest sites 
uh, for barn owls. Um, they're so called because they used to be quite regular in barns, but the way we use barns is a bit different than it was sort of 50, 100 years ago when they, the hay was basically stored in the barn and you didn't go in there again till the following year. But now it's all sort of, you know, industrialized and and, and, and the sheds are being used regularly for, for vehicles and um, machinery and and, 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 and and animals and stuff. So this is a this is a barn owl box in in a in a in a in a ruin. This is a typical one in in a, in a barn, uh, an outdoor box on a tree there, and another one in a ruin. So these triangular ones are more weather resistant, I suppose. The the, the water just goes off them quicker and less damage. But these indoor ones don't need to be treated so much, and they can have a flat roof as well. So the both designs, and we have we have a booklet on that that I'll show you that shows both designs, uh, and I'm not sure. I don't know if there's sort of suitable sites, but there's a lovely bit of countryside around Fingal. So any of the villages and towns, the sort of the edges of the towns or any of the farms there, if you know local farmers, uh, there should be tons of sites to get a barn owl box project on the go. It's a really nice thing. You could do maybe local men's sheds, get 10 or 15 boxes made up uh, and, uh, you know, and then find 10 or 15 sites to get them erected and put them up and then have someone monitor them. Uh, to see if they're successful and, and, and see if the population is growing low. It'd be really nice and be a really good conservation measure. So here's a Kestrel box, way up a tree. Um, again, very simple box, basically like a giant dipper box, just a, a big open front of box. Here's one in the shed. Kestrels will roost and nest in sheds as well. Uh, <clears throat> and so really good thing to do as well. And, and they're in bother as well. A uh, big problem with big roads and stuff since we put in all the motorways. Uh, raptors like bur like barn owls and kestrels, they they tend to get drawn to the edges of these big roads because what happens is all the rodents come along, they get to the road, they can't cross these huge, uh, huge roads, so they start going up and down the edges, and that's why the the barn owls and the kestrels are attracted. But when they're hunting, they take their eye off the ball, and and before you know it, a car or a lorry or whatever hits them. So we tend to tell people not to put up kestrel or barn owl boxes anywhere near an A road um, or near any sort of busy road at all. So down well down a lane or in a rural area, we don't don't put them up on on, on a near busy roads for that reason. So here's just a um, barn owl box guide that we made recently. It's available on our on our website, but uh, we also have a full booklet that offers the design for the for the internal uh, version as well. So but that's a nice friendly version for uh, maybe uh, transition year students or woodwork students or something like that might be a nice one to share with local schools if if there's anyone doing that course. So here's the booklet. This was uh, published by John Lusby, a colleague years ago. It looks it looks a bit aged, but all the information is um <clears throat> is still very current and um loads and loads of stuff in that. It's it's actually it's 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 um it's really really useful. And again that's available on download on, on our on our website. Actually if you Google Barn Owls in Ireland You'll find it. I think Dublin Zoo um, has it on their website as a PDF as well. You can download it. It's out of it's out of the ball. It's out of publish now. So you, you, very hard to get a hard copy of it. This is a very recent one that John did. Sorry, just get a drink. And um, this is called Wildlife in Buildings. <clears throat> Comes in two parts. It's quite big. A lot of pictures in it, and it's talking about all aspects of wildlife in buildings, including bats and mammals such as pine martens. So if you've got big old ruins or abandoned um, farm buildings or, you know, people who do, it's a really nice um, resource to sort of to show people because we get a lot of questions. And even I know <clears throat> uh, there's stuff about gulls as well. And I know there's all always argy bargy with, with gulls and Balbriggan and stuff. So um, there is a lot of stuff there uh, worth considering. Various case studies and focuses on all the different species. Uh, when to find them, how to find them, where to find them, what to do, uh, and how to, to accommodate them and mitigate or, uh, and, and, and work around them and stuff. So it's really good resource, and that's only recently published. Some nice stuff there. Again, Swifts, Barn Owls. Cool. So that's kind of come to the end there now. Um, just got contact details. I will, um, I, well, we're going to share this video anyway. Um, and also, I wonder um, how we get these. I don't want everyone to have to frantically scribble these down, but um, it'll be on the video once we once we post it anyway. So I think that's probably the best way of doing it.
Great. Um, I wonder, would you be able to stop recording now, Ricky, and we'll go into the Q&A. Thank you.